Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, first off, I want to uh, start off by talking about our schedule. <laughs> As uh, some of you know, I have some complications uh, in that I have some medical procedures that uh, have come about. And um, uh, so we will not have class next week or the week after that. Um, and, and so what that means is what was to be our last class on uh, May uh, 11th will now be our sixth class. And then the seventh will be on May 18 and the eighth on May 25th. Now for anyone where that doesn't work out or that's a problem in one way or another, uh, just send me an email, let me know and I'll set up another time to uh, do the class for you. Um, and, and I'll put those dates, uh, whoops, I'll, I'll put those uh, dates in the chat for everybody. Good, good. And I'll also incorporate that in the summary that I, that I send out. So um, I apologize for having to make that change, um, but as you can suspect, there's not much <laughs> choice. Um, anyway, so um, this is you know, this beginning of the second half of this second series of classes on a, a revised history of America, and it's centered around the 24 things that I think someone needs to know to understand American history. And it's uh, not a whole bunch of dates and battles and that sort of thing. It really is, are those events that shape our culture, shape our economy, and uh, shape our uh, political system. And the, the mindset, the worldview of Americans. So um, today, so in this second uh, uh, set of classes, uh, what I wanted to do is break out Bacon's Rebellion and Wedge Politics. Uh, I want to talk about the soil because the soil of North America is uh, uh, unique in many respects. And uh, there's a reason why certain products did well here. And, uh, and, and so it becomes a very important factor in understanding why America has enjoyed the success that it has. Then I want to talk about settler colonialism. Uh, you have the colonists who come over and settle, England, France, Spain. Then the people who settle start colonizing from where they settled and they start attacking the Native Americans. And so we'll, it, it is a, it's a, it's a area of history that has its own designation, settler colonialism. Um, and so it's really important. And then uh, I want to conclude this second series with the French and Indian War, which become the, the, the implications of it uh, really become one of the key factors in prompting the American Revolution. Um, so, but first, we're going to start with Bacon's Rebellion. And uh, for many of us, when we were in school in our early years. What we were taught was that Bacon's Rebellion, which happens in the mid 17th century uh, in the uh, British colonies, um, we're taught that it was early evidence of the independence spirit of the colonists. That's and and if you if you recall any of your tests from those days, they you know what was the significance of Bacon's Rebellion? The significance was that it exhibited the independence spirit of the colonists. That was the correct. If you gave anything else, you were wrong. Um, but th that answer is wrong. <laughs> That's not what was significant about. It. Um, the, what they don't, what we, we weren't taught was about how it played in the racial animus that became a central part uh, of, uh, of America. And uh, I pulled out a quote from 
a book by Vincent Brown, professor at Harvard, uh, his book, Tacky's Revolt, uh, excellent piece of work about uh, the Caribbean and the islands and what went on there, which became a prelude to things that happened in uh, North America. And so he quotes from Isaiah, uh, and I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. Think about that in terms of our contemporary politics. <laughs> and so it's the idea of how can I drive one against the other? After the end of the English Civil War, which was in the 17th century, and that was a fight between the monarchy and parliament. Who was going to have the power? Um, and this is from a book by Don Jordan, who was a journalist, um, and uh, his, his work on the uh, indentured servants that populated North America is really a very well-written and, and interesting book. Um, after the end of the English Civil War, Virginia had been viewed by Cromwell as a dumping ground, not just for the Irish, but for English undesirables too. Remember we talked about the Enclosure Acts and, and all that was involved with that. Cromwell's military commanders swept up hundreds of prostitutes, beggars and vagrants with a view to transportation. Remember we talked about the Transportation Acts, transporting them into America. These are not your yeoman farmers that we've been talking, that we've been presented with in our history classes. Um, these are, this is the people who were scooped up off the streets of Liverpool and London, put on a ship and sent <laughs> into North America to populate the colonies. And why does England become the predominant European power uh, to control the Americas? It's because England was the most aggressive in populating their colony. So it was sheer numbers. There are a lot more English people than there were Spanish or French in the colonies by the time of the American Revolution. In one surprise attack, 120 Native Americans were slaughtered. What became known as the Battle of Bloody Run Bacon boasted how his war party fell upon the men, women, and children, disarmed and destroyed them all. No, that's not a quote from Ukraine. That's a quote from the early colonial days of America. Now, what we have is uh, only three of uh, Bacon's men were killed and he became a hero. Uh, I want to uh, really highlight Bacon's rebellion because this is a very significant event in the trajectory of American history. Uh, in the uh, 1600s, mid 1600s, the uh, colonists, uh, these are, mind you, the, these are the British entrepreneurs who uh, wanted to jump into the new world competition that Spain had initiated. They, and, and the French followed um, with, with their so-called explorers who were going out to see what can we grab out of this uh, landmass that we've discovered. New technology, the Navigator's Astrolab opened up the oceans that could now be traversed and could be claimed by the foreign powers operating under the doctrine of discovery that gave them the legal foundation for doing so. And so, so when we're in the mid 1600s, mind you, England has not really asserted control over the colonies. It, the, the, it, England has issued corporate charters to the entrepreneurs who wanna 
go forth and discover new lands, it's be, which they can do on their own money. <laughs> but you have to do it under the rule of the crown. But it's, it really remains ambiguous. Uh, and in fact, the reason that uh, King Charles decided to settle uh, South Carolina is because he's decided now he's going to assert some control over this colonial adventure. But in Virginia, uh, 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 Nathaniel Bacon uh, is, um, uh, you know, he has his lands and, and he has in white indentured uh, slaves working those lands. And he has uh, uh, slaves that have been purchased from the African slave trade. Um, and he wants more Indian lands. However, England is reticent in uh, wanting to aggressively take more lands because England is involved in colonial adventures in a lot of different places and it's costly and uh, they really don't have a focus. They're kind of going in too many different directions. So they are resistant to expanding in North America. And remember, North America is not the, the, the crown jewel. That's in the islands of the lesser and greater Antilles. So, um, so they just don't want to do it. And Bacon is angry about that. And so he starts a rebellion. But Bacon uh, dies <laughs> during the rebellion. And the rebellion fizzles out. However, what Bacon did in creating the rebellion is he got his white slaves and black slaves to come together to fight against England in their rebellion. And that sh sent shockwaves through Virginia. Because if the white slaves and the black slaves joined together, they would be able to crush the uh, people leading the colonial enterprises. And so as a result of Bacon's rebellion, uh, the House of Burgess in uh, Virginia then passes laws that stipulate, here is what you can do to your black slave, here is what you cannot do to your white slave. And by making those kinds of distinctions, it set them apart. It drove a wedge. It gave that poor white slave a sense of being superior to the black slave. Because see, master cannot do to me what master can do to them. And so it becomes a very important part of American history. And that, that, that uh, technique, uh, that model gets used time and time again, driving wedges uh, between populations who have similar interests uh, so that the uh, people who are benefiting from the system uh, continue to stay in power. Now, I have some videos I want to share with you. Uh, however, I, I need to say that, as you could see with the Enclosure Acts uh, and the Transportation Acts, that there are uh, really <laughs> very few uh, videos of real quality. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a, I mean, I have to, these that I have, I think are good, but they're, you know, I mean, I had to hunt through many to try to find something that I thought would capture the information. And mind you, this is a very significant part of American history. Why is it? <laughs> we haven't had sophisticated, slick documentaries made on topics like the impact of the Enclosure Acts and Transportation Acts on the founding of America, the impact of Bacon's rebellion on creating racial animus in America, we, 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 the, the stuff we saw in the past couple of weeks about Barbados and what happened in South Carolina, that those have, you know, are some pretty good productions, but they've been made in the past five years. So it's, it's just, it's, it's interesting. All this time, these things 
you know, we, you weren't going to get any of that. You'll have a lot about Washington crossing the Delaware, but nothing about any of these things that paint a different picture about America. Let's have a look at this. Bacon's Rebellion today, which is really one of the most important early conflicts in American history, you're going to have some very far-reaching ramifications. It all goes down in 1676 in Virginia. And remember, Virginia controlled by England at this time. England had been in control of Virginia since it first settled there in 1607 in Jamestown. So let me explain a couple groups and then the rebellion and then uh, the major effect of it. So the first group you've got to understand and know about the rebellion are the Tidewater aristocrats. And you, this picture really sums them up right here, but let's break down this term here. Tidewater, they call Tidewater because they lived in the Tidewater region of Virginia, which was like the coastal area, close to all the little river inlets and Chesapeake area, prime real estate. Uh, aristocrats, because they were rich, right? They lived in these big houses right here on these huge plantations, and they grew lots of tobacco, and then they would ship it back to England, make a fortune. They also control the first elected assembly known as the House of Burgesses, the, the governing body of Virginia at that time, is controlled by the, the Tidewater aristocrats for the most part. The other group you got to understand are these guys right here, indentured servants. Zoom in here. Um, these guys were the people who worked on the plantations of the Tidewater aristocrats. So you have to understand right now that slavery is not big in the United States yet. Where did they get their labor from, these Tidewater aristocrats? These guys, indentured servants. An indentured servant was essentially a poor person from England or Scotland or some other country who for their passage to the New World, which was paid for by the Tidewater aristocrat, would work on that Tidewater aristocrat's plantation for usually the year was, the amount, it was about seven years. But after those seven years, they were free to go do what they want. So it's oftentimes a good way of maybe kind of starting a, a new life. And so now by 1676, we have a lot of indentured servants who have been freed, who have worked their seven years um, and now are free in this new world to start their own life. And where do a lot of them go? Well, they can't go to the Tidewater, so they go inland. They go westward to the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it's called the backcountry in Virginia. And they begin to settle their own land. And they run into a group who's living on that land. Who do those indentured servants? Hold on, something's not happening here. Not aristocrats. So you have to understand right now, that's plantation for you. And where do a lot of them go? Well, they can't go to the Tidewater, so they go inland. They go westward to the Blue Ridge Mountains, and it's called the backcountry in Virginia. And they begin to settle their own land. And they run into a group who's living on that land. Who do those indentured servants run into? The Native Americans. And they start to have a lot of conflict with the Native Americans. And one of the guys decides who is one of the backcountry farmers living out there, name is Nathaniel Bacon, decides we need some help back here. And so he makes a plea to the House of Burgesses. He says, will you help us, the backcountry landowners, defeat these Native Americans out here? House of Burgesses refuses to help because what Nathaniel Bacon, this guy right here, doesn't realize is the House of Burgesses has a secret deal with the Native Americans for trading. And so Nathaniel Bacon takes his followers, and that's where you get this picture right here, and he marches to the House of Burgesses, confronts them, who House of Burgess is led by this guy right here, William Berkeley, and says, you better help us with the Native Americans. If you don't, we're going to burn this building down. As a show of force, he goes and burns down parts of Jamestown. He says, you're next. And then Nathaniel Bacon and his followers retreat, and kind of out of the blue, he ends up getting sick and dying of dysentery. And so his rebellion is essentially over. And so big question has been raised among the Tidewater aristocrats now. What are we going to do with these indentured servants who all of a sudden become free, but then they go looking for new land and end up causing these big conflicts like Nathaniel Bacon has just done? How can we get a form of labor in here who we don't have to set free? And so in a really indirect way, Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion leads to slavery in this new world because these Tidewater aristocrats realize, well, what Every time we free these indentured servants, they go move out to the back country and cause a ruckus like this rebellion. Well, let's get some labor in here that we never have to free. And so 
the slave trade is going to take off in a very big way after Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion. 1680s, 1690s, early 1700s, the African slave trade in the Americans is going to flourish. And that is in large part because indentured servitude, in the eyes of the Tidewater aristocrats at least, has failed. And slavery becomes a lot cheaper and you never have to... What do all these images have in common? What does racism have to do with Jamestown? In this documentary, I will trace the story back to one event in particular that may have changed the opinions on equality in America. Bacon's Rebellion of 1676 broke the barriers of indentured servitude to demonstrate that there could be, as the colonists thought, a better form of manual labor. Although Bacon guaranteed freedom to blacks who participated in the rebellion, African American slaves were mistreated in the South. Slavery grew the South's economy at the expense of its workers, and maybe the root of racism in America today. In 17th century Virginia, many poor, unemployed, and heavily taxed frontiersmen began believing they had unfair rights. Along with many Indian attacks, which were devastating to populations, these pioneers needed to do something about Virginia's government and its governor, Sir William Barclay. But what would they do, and how would they do it? Arriving in Virginia in 1619 were black and white indentured servants. The head right system created by the Virginia Company granted land to immigrants. Colonists who were poor became indentured servants and worked for the elite. Being at the bottom of the pecking order, they felt left out of Virginia society. These indentured servants would become the rebels. The frontiersmen needed a leader who knew Barclay well. Nathaniel Bacon, a wealthy planter, caught their interest. Born in 1647 in England, he was young compared to the 70-year-old Barclay. He had been inaugurated as a member of the governor's council the previous year and began to have a resentment against him. He obliterated many Okanche Indians without the permission from Barclay. Some historians suspect that Bacon's early conflict with Barclay may have been that they were competitors in Indian trade. No one knows for sure. Since Bacon disliked Barclay, he was the perfect leader the rebels needed. They would begin to plot the rebellion. Bacon was up against an experienced opponent. Barclay was Virginia's longest serving governor, a playwright, and author of Discourse and View of Virginia. He received an A.B. and an A.M. from Oxford University and was declared a fellow of Merton College. He was knighted for his military service and even wrote plays for the king and queen. Bacon's enemy had a whole force of wealthy planners at his side, known as the Loyalists. Bacon and the rebels drafted a declaration of grievances against Barclay. This would state what barriers they needed to break. He had suspicious presences of public works and raised outrageous taxes for Virginians to pay. He had his private favorites, which he gave advances to. They needed their rights under control. As conflicts began to brew, Barclay called on his superiors in London to replace him with a more vigorous governor. The rebels needed their freedom, and there was only one way to do that. They went directly for Barclay to challenge his authority. When Bacon was at Jamestown, he first pardoned the governor, although the second time, Barclay showed Bacon his chest and declared him to shoot. Bacon burned Jamestown then and there, and sent Barclay and his loyalists fleeing for the eastern shore. At that point, there were more Bacians than loyalists. At the height of the rebellion, before Barclay could call in royal forces, Bacon suddenly died of dysentery on October 26, 1676. It shocked Virginia. The rebellion caused Charles II to sign a proclamation for putting down the war on October 27, 1676, unaware of Bacon's death. The conflict wasn't over yet, though. The rebels continued. 
England sent more than a thousand soldiers led by Colonel Herbert Jeffreys, a three-member commission, and a naval fleet led by Sir John Barry to kill Bacon and search for causes of the rebellion. At this point, it was over for Barclay as his political clout was diminished. In an attempt to regain his position, he went to London and arrived in July 1677. He was sick, weakened by the crossing, and a broken man. He died on July 9, 1677. Ever since the American Revolution to as recent as the 1950s, the popular view of the rebellion was that as a predecessor to the American Revolution, a premature war against the crown that represented a short-term setback for American liberty. What historians of the past never realized is that Bacon's rebellion created slavery in America. Slavery existed before 1676, but the conflict made it the dominant labor force. Dominating over Virginia for many years after the rebellion were slave-owning families such as the Washingtons, the Randolphs, the Carters, and Lees. Bacon's rebellion was, as summarized by one writer, a large cultural event in the origin of the Old South. As slavery took over, indentured servitude was completely abandoned. For over 150 years, slaves were mistreated by planters. Eventually, slavery became strictly a southern tradition, disapproved by the North, and slave owners fought to keep them. This would lead to the Civil War. As new rights were given to freed African Americans, southern whites became offended. As this continued, so developed modern racism and a struggle for equality. Bacon's rebellion may have happened over three centuries ago, but its influence is still felt by many Americans today. From the American Revolution to the Civil Rights Movement, the Rebellion has withstood the course of time. When it comes to breaking barriers, Bacon's Rebellion broke many that are key ideas in American history. These concepts influence our thinking today. So we have, um, uh, you know, Bacon's Rebellion uh, is, you know, it, it, it's, it's like given as the predecessor of the American Revolution against Britain. Uh, but the real story of Bacon's Rebellion is about Indian lands dominating the Indians and uh, using slaves to extract wealth out of the earth. What was the American Revolution about? taxation without representation. No, it was really about taking more Indian lands and using enslaved labor to extract uh, wealth from, from the ground. Now, you're gonna find this a little weird, but uh, I just thought I'd give you this as a, you know, kind of a, a diversion of a, a, a hip hop version of uh, Bacon Rebellion. Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. A little colonial history on tap for you today as we rewind the clock back to 1676 and we get ready for every vegetarian's nightmare, Bacon's Rebellion. Let's take a look at the causes that led up to the rebellion, the actual rebellion itself, and what's gonna be on the test. The effects, you know it, kids. So let's go giddy up for the learning as we go get her done right now. So Bacon's Rebellion is going to be in 1676, but of course we're going to start before that. Not in the founding of Jamestown, that's a different story, and certainly John Smith and they had a lot of problems and yada yada yada. But after a couple of decades, things start to calm down and there's an increase in immigration. There's lots of reasons why people want to escape Europe, escape England. They're in debt, it's overcrowded, there's religious Protestant Catholic war stuff going on. But really, this represents hope. This represents a way out. So you have people that are coming over to the Virginia colony and there's different types of people. There's people with Momo and people without Momo. Now, in the head right system, oh, vocabulary, I love you. In the head right system, for every ticket that you could afford, you got 50 acres of land. So if you were wealthy, you could come over and get a lot of land. But if you didn't have Momo in the head right system, you'd come over owing. You'd be an indentured servant. And that meant you had to dedicate five to seven years of your life working hard labor before you got some land. So that's really the labor system. Of course, there's slavery. The first slave ship comes in 1619 in Jamestown, but the system is heavily dependent upon indentured servants, and this creates a class system. 
those with and those without. Now, the people that are living on the coast near Jamestown, kind of the Tidewater region, these are the elite, these are the powerful, these are the people with Momo. And then the people without Momo, these indentured servants and others that couldn't afford to live there, would get kind of the not so great land out in the west, the frontier. And these people are surrounded by Native Americans. They have the Amatoks and the Manchows and the Oranaxes. And there's five or six Native American tribes that I can't pronounce that are surrounding them. So by 1670, you have some problems. You have a problem of these people that are living in the frontier feeling as though they're being ignored. They're feeling like they're being overtaxed. They're feeling like their rights aren't being watched out. For. And there's other problems. There's not enough women. The women who do come over, uh, much fewer than the men, they're going to be marrying the people that are in the Tidewater region, the elite. Why are you going to marry some guy out in the West uh, surrounded by Native Americans with no money? So there's a lot of reasons why these frontiersmen, these people in the Virginia colony living out in the Western frontier, are angry. Now you have a governor in William Berkeley, and he is firmly in the position of being in the elite. Not only is he in the elite in the sense that he's ignoring kind of what these frontier peoples want, but he also has a very big interest in the lucrative fur trade. He doesn't want to upset his relations with these Native Americans, so in a sense he's siding with his moneyed interest rather than the people themselves. And then in 1670, the House of Burgesses, oh I love the House of Burgesses, this first representative body in the New World is going to strip these frontiersmen that uh, don't own land, that aren't in the elite, that are poor, of their voting rights. So that's not necessarily going to go over very well. So there's a lot of causes, but I think the main ones are a lack of land, the Native Americans, they're upset with the elite controlling the fur trade. They feel as though now that their suffrage has been taken away, they're certainly being taxed without representation. So they're going to be angry, they're going to start gathering up, and there's going to be a rebellion. Okay, well, I thought I'd uh, not uh, let that, it's kind of like you're on speed as you listen to, to that, but I thought I'd give you another uh, approach to it. And here's uh, yet another. In 1607, settlers showed up at the site of the Jamestown colony. Thus began the first permanent English settlement in North America. Shortly after this, Settlers came as indentured servants or wealthy individuals looking to make their fortune in America. This provided the backdrop for the first class struggle in American history. Nathaniel Bacon was a wealthy lawyer who immigrated to Jamestown from England in 1675. Having left England with a considerable amount of cash, Bacon purchased two plantations located on the James River. Bacon was also well connected to established colonists when he arrived. Using his wealth and skills as a lawyer and connections to Jamestown government, he became a popular figure among the poor Virginian farmers. Where Bacon's plantations were located, Native Americans would sometimes attack and loot colonists. Feeling threatened by Indian attacks and already upset by rising taxes, the poor farmers were ready for a fight. Bacon likely was motivated by protecting his own plantations, but he was well enough liked by the poor Virginian farmers to be elected to the colonial government, known as the House of Burgesses. Bacon wanted to send his own militia, which is an armed group of citizens, to go and fight Native Americans. The governor of the colony saw this as an act of rebellion and arrested Bacon. When 2,000 of Bacon's supporters showed up, the governor decided he would let Bacon go with an apology. Following this, Bacon seized his momentum and began to attack Indians nearby. Bacon even drafted a paper to provide reasons for the rebellion, called Declaration of the People. In this document, Bacon complained that the government had unfairly taxed its citizens, an idea that played well with the people that were living in poverty. The Declaration also alleged that 
the government had not done enough to protect against Indian attacks. During the rebellion, Bacon controlled much of Jamestown with the help of his supporters. At 29 years of age, he was an Indian fighter, rebel, and leader for the poor farmers and indentured servants who became upset by the growing distance between the wealthy Virginia elite and the common farmer. It all ended suddenly when Bacon died from illness and the remaining rebel leaders were arrested and executed. But the plantation owners learned a lesson from this event. When whites, blacks, freemen, servants, and slaves all acted together, they could challenge the authority of the government, if only temporarily. And so um, I want to, I hope you can hear some themes from the 1670s that we hear today. And, and why I think that is so important is that it, um, when we think about the contemporary events and we get what we get on the news and it's narrowly framed, you, re, you can come to realize, wait a minute, this isn't new, this is following a pattern. This is just the exercise of wedge politics of us against them. You know, I mean, so I, mean, I did a class on the history of slavery and uh, someone said, you know, well, what can we do about it? I said, well, I think we have, we know things that we can do to deal with our racial animus. And this one person got very angry and said, no, you don't know <laughs> that um, uh, if you knew uh, people, you would be out there doing it and people would want you to do it because no one wants racial animus. And uh, the, the, <laughs> the thing is, is that there are people who benefit from racial animus. It is a tool and it's an effective tool. It's an effective political tool. I, I want to show you the, the Trump announcement of starting his campaign in 2016. Because it, it's really important to uh, recognize here, you know, when you go down the list of things with, with Trump, um, disrespects, uh, gold star mother and father, uh, his own chief of staff, he's walking with him through Arlington and where, he, where his chief of staff's son is buried after having fought in, in Iraq. And, uh, you know, says to him, why do they do this? They, they seem like suckers and losers, people who sacrifice for the country. Um, wanted to give people a, a, you know, a chlorine enema to deal with, a, you know, with a pandemic. Uh, it, it, it is, and yet 77 million people cast their ballot for, for that. And it, it, I think the only way you can understand it is if you go back into the history and you look at it going forward and you see this, this campaign against the others in such a way that um, it, it is deeply embedded in the brains of, of many people and in their hearts and in their souls. And so along comes a candidate who really proclaims white nationalism and uh, uh, and and it, 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 I, you know I'm so, I don't see any other issues that were there for people to want to gravitate, uh, and that's uh, what you have. So let's just take a look at this and see if you can see the uh, uh, continuity, as I'm suggesting.
That is some group of people, thousands. So nice, thank you very much. That's really nice, thank you. It's great to be at Trump Tower. It's great to be in a wonderful city, New York. And it's an honor to have everybody here. This is beyond anybody's expectations. There's been no crowd like this. And I can tell you, some of the candidates they went in, they didn't know the air conditioner didn't work. They sweated like dogs. They didn't know the room was too big because they didn't have anybody there. How are they going to beat ISIS? I don't think it's going to happen. Our country is in serious trouble. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't have them. When was the last time anybody saw us beating, let's say, China in a trade deal? They kill us. I beat China all the time, all the time. When did we beat Japan at anything? They send their cars over by the millions. And what do we do? When was the last time you saw a Chevrolet in Tokyo? It doesn't exist, folks. They beat us all the time. When do we beat Mexico at the border? They're laughing at us, at our stupidity. And now they're beating us economically. They are not our friend, believe me. But they're killing us economically. The U.S. has become a dumping ground for everybody else's problems. <laughs> Thank you. It's true. And these are the best and the finest. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. But I speak to border guards, and they tell us what we're getting. Well, I think you get the point there. Um, the, it's, um, I, 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 you know, it's a, it, there, you know, his themes are, who are the enemies? They're Asians, they're Mexicans. Uh, he'll go on that there'll be Muslims. There won't be, you know, he, he's not gonna pick on the jury, he's not gonna pick on <laughs> people of, of uh, similarly skinned people, the Germans, the French, the English, that, that's not, it's gonna be those people. So it's just, it's not about the moment, it's about a great bigger trend. Now, one other thing that I wanna share with you, and that is, uh, again, an event in Virginia where, um, they begin to establish that uh, black slaves are to be treated differently than white slaves, where black slaves are property and uh, indentured slaves are only property during the period of the indenture. Three men on the same farm, doing the same labor, being harassed, and oppressed on a comparable level to the point that these three men chose to flee their owner. John Punch, Victor, and James Gregory crossed the Virginia border into Southern Maryland. Days later, they were captured and returned. In the colony's highest court, it was said that Hugh Gwynne's servants caused him considerable loss and prejudice. The two white men are sentenced to simply a number of years added to their indentures. For John Punch, the one black among these three men, his fate 
is infinitely worse, it's servitude for life. For the rest of your life. Oh, now, there's no law that says that John Punch had to have been enslaved for life, but uh, it was clear that 1640 is sort of the turning point, the beginning of the point where Africans are going to be treated differently as opposed to whites who are indentured servants. Rather than distinguishing people because they are unfree, people are being distinguished now because they're black or white. And that whiteness is privileging in ever increasing and in beneficial ways. And that establishes again that uh, separation between white people and black people. Um, uh, let me just kind of summarize here if I can get this to change. There we go. There we go. No. Uh, the poor whites derive satisfaction from their relative status to the blacks, which caused every white man to think himself a man of first consequence. They did not condescend to work in the cane fields with their inferiors. The slaves, not the lower class whites, posed the greatest threat of revolt in the Caribbean. The political dominance of the often British educated planter elite was virtually unchallenged by white small planters and artisans. They seemed to think that the greatness of their masters was transferable to themselves. It was considered as being bad enough to be a slave, but to be a poor man's slave was deemed a disgrace indeed. Okay. Lauren, we can uh, open up for comments, questions, discussion. Okay, and people can uh, start their videos again and use the raise the hand feature uh, to ask questions, make comments. Uh, and uh, I think, here we go, Nancy, just unmute yourself. Uh, well, I was just uh, wondering out of curiosity if this Nathaniel Bacon had any relationship at all to Francis Bacon, the scientist. Yeah, they, uh, I believe cousins. I believe they're cousins. Well, they would have been in about the same, uh, around the same time period. And I was just thinking that, you know, one, a successful scientist who mm -hmm. more or less invented the scientific theory. Uh, and then the other one is... Created the, 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 white different... <laughs> the white supremacy theory, right? Yeah. 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 No, they are related. Yes. I, I think it, it, it really, the uh, for me, the importance of Nathaniel Bacon uh, can't be overstated. Um, and there's certainly people can argue it and that kind of thing. But if, if when you see that shortly thereafter, the House of Burgesses passes legislation establishing different rules that, and, and it, that it creates for that poor underclass white who felt at the bottom of the rung, they now had the ability to not be at the bottom. There was somebody below them. And it became very important over the years to keep somebody at a lower level. And, uh, uh, and, and, and they would fight to the death in the Civil War for that. Remember, the people who are fighting that war aren't the people who are really benefiting from slavery. But, <laughs> but to keep Black people at a rung below them was uh, uh, worth their life.
in terms of the timeline, where does this um, co you know, uh, where is this on the timeline relative to the Somerset's case in uh, England? This is a hundred years before. Okay. And so uh, you have, and mind you, this is also the time when uh, the Barbadians are coming into South Carolina, bringing ideas of white supremacy with them. So the uh, um, convergence of Bacon's Rebellion, the Barbadians entering into South Carolina with a draconian black slave code uh, really uh, makes slavery a very important, mind you, uh, Virginia is a big money maker of the early colonies for, of the 13 North American colonies. The big money is being made in the, in the, uh, in the West Indies. But this is, uh, mind you, this is the foundation for the creation of wealth and power. So a hundred years later, when um, Christian evangelicals in England uh, go to court to eliminate slavery <laughs> and win their case in England, the shock waves through the colonies uh, is enormous. It's enormous. It's, 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 almost, it's almost as big as being a major restaurateur and suddenly a pandemic hits. And you're out of business for the next two years. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna fight to keep your place. Yeah, it's just, it's very, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, when you look at the things, <laughs> when I look at things that we were, weren't taught in, in school, and now I look at them and I go, wait a minute, that's a big deal. <laughs> that is, you know, it, it, really, this is skipping over some very substantive, this helps to explain why uh, racial animus is so deeply embedded in the American culture. And it's not, and, and mind you, what I this is now once you establish that for the white population it becomes a a real goal to keep black people down that means that is a political tool so is so as long as it's there if I'm the person who is uh, campaigning on the basis of racial animus. Um, I, it, it can, it, it, it's very effective. You know, I win elections and mind you, we can look at the Republicans today and say, they're the racist party. It wasn't that long ago that it was the democratic party. That was the racist party. So it was, who's going to take this, this political tool and run with it. And so if you said, well, we need to do something to eliminate it, you would, you, you you're up against having to take away a very powerful political tool in a very political country. I, I know that this is skipping ahead, but uh, was Barbados still the, um, the prize at the time of the American Revolution, like uh, relative to you know, the American continent? The, 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 the reason England could not commit the resources to fight the uh, American Revolution was because America, North America, wasn't that important to it. There were bigger fish to fry. That was Barbados, that was Jamaica, where they had problems, they had rebellions. <laughs> and so they, uh, that was, we, we were just not at the, at the we were not a priority. India, China were far more important than North America. Uh, we were not the moneymaker. So kind of a luck of timing, really. Right, right. All things considered. And, and part of, you know, as we go ahead, part of what I'm arguing is that um, the, the prime motivation for the people who led the American Revolution the prime motivation was a product of the French Indian War, which said, 
colonists, you can't go across to proclamate the Appalachian Mountains. You can't go across there to go and steal more Indian lands. And that's in 1763. Um, and in 1772 was the James Somerset case, which posed a threat to slavery. Those were the two things that were essential for, be, for creating wealth and power. And when those things were, were either threatened or cut off, that is what galvanized the leadership to say we have to fight for independence. Because remind you, it, during the French Indian War, George Washington was fighting on whose behalf? England. <laughs> what, what made him change his mind? The proclamation line that happens right after that war. Because <laughs> George Washington got rich uh, in what was America's first business enterprise, which was real estate. And he was a big landowner. Right. He owned Kentucky, West Virginia, the Ohio River Valley. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I mean, that's a, that represents a lot of wealth. Um, and and that's, uh, that's how he got rich. His, and we're going to talk about this, but his brother was the president of the Ohio River Company. That was a land speculating company. Uh, and what happens with land speculated that England says, okay, we now have this territory is ours. They just arbitrarily say, we're taking this other chunk of land in the Ohio River Valley. Now, Indians may be occupying that land, but that doesn't bother England. They just say, we're taking this. And they take it, and then they create parcels out of that land, and they auction it off to the land speculators. So George Washington's brother was with a company that would then buy that land. They would subdivide it again and then sell it off to people who wanted to expand their tobacco farms and that kind of thing. And that's, a, and that's how George Washington got wealthy. And it was that, that when it, after the French Indian War, England said, we can't afford to have any more wars. And they draw a line down the Appalachian uh, mountains and say, you can't go across this line. Well, when you say you can't go across this line, it means you're going to cut off the business of the land speculators and the people who want to expand. So it was, um, we need to declare independence. But they needed workers for all that land. Right. And that and meant the slave the trade. Of that. Oh, no. Well, the, uh, do we have any other questions? I don't see any raised hands right now. I think, Lucretia, are you going to, uh, were you raising your hand? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, everyone. Susan, be well. Everybody, be well. We'll see.